Welcome everyone to Punk Toss Father podcast number 23. Today we are going to talk about uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's Silmarillion and Atlantis. And uh, we've got a lot of interesting research uh, for you today into uh, uh, Tolkien's Island of Numenor as kind of uh, Atlantis mythologizing call it. Uh, his concept of these gems called the Silmarils that are part of the Silmarillion and one of the major uh, focal points, almost like the way the rings uh, are in the Lord of the Rings. The Silmarils are kind of tied to the greater mythology of uh, the first two ages of Middle-earth and sort of the origins of Middle-earth, as Tolkien kind of talks about it. And then also the idea of Atlantis in general, you know, things that we've got down to us from Plato, but especially we're going to look into the Emerald Tablets of Thoth or Emerald Tablets of Hermes Trimagestus. So we'll uh, get into all of that today. It should be very interesting. Uh, we're going to start out with, let's look at how Tolkien um, worked a bit, some of his inspirations from some of his letters. We'll dip into histories of Numenor and the Silmarils, and then we'll kind of cross-reference it with things from Emerald Tablets, uh, Necromocene Yarlothotep, some Steiner, some Plato, some Blavatsky. So it should be something interesting uh, comes out of today. Uh, first off, before we jump into it, quick shout out to our classic August Moldenhauer trilogy, Tattoo Journals out of Lovecraft's Providence, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Uh, helps to keep the lights on, helps the researchers have coffee, uh, genealogy of Cthulhu, psychoanalysis of Rilia, archaeology of Yogg-Sothoth. It's the uh, first Lovecraftian uh, trilogy, and it is um, perfect for a fan of Cthulhu, uh, fans of the esoteric and occult, in, in the sense of it links actual history back to uh, Lovecraft's process, Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. Uh, we'll also be talking today a bit from Giuseppe Balsamo's uh, Necromancy of Narlathotep. Again, a companion sequel, uh, Introductions by Moldenhauer, but this time um, we're looking at the Necronomicon fragments from the first trilogy and expanding it into the ideas of necromancy, the alchemical process, and then Hermeticism in general. Uh, these books are in proof, Necromancy of Narlathotep's uh, available online now, so you can go check that one out. Uh, we'll be doing some revisions on the last two books, should be available uh, Q, Q1 and 2 of 2022. So just some uh, interesting things to help support the channel. Obviously, if you guys um, comment, share, like, check out our Patreon, all those things help too. So we really appreciate your support. So let's jump right into... Um, the topic today, and we'll talk a little bit first about Tolkien's initial interest with Atlantis. Uh, he had written a, a letter to W.H. Uh, uh, Auden in the 1950s, and Tolkien had talked about uh, Numenor as sort of like uh, his version of the Atlantis myth. And he says in this letter, uh, I say... Uh, this is about the heart, for I have somewhat might be called an Atlantis complex, possibly inherited, though my parents died very young to me, and I didn't know of such things. And he goes, um, uh, it was inherited from me, from my children, and maybe I was too young to transfer things by words. And though I did know this about my son until recently, that he did not know about me, and this is the terrible recurrent dream, beginning with memory, of the great wave towering up, and coming electively over the trees and the green fields, a dream which I bequeathed it to Faramir. I don't think I've written down the downfall of Numenor as the last little legends of the first and second age. So here he is talking a bit about how he had a dream that he's calling the Atlantis Complex, and he had he had this recurring dream. And and and, and Tolkien also goes on to say uh, in some other letters where it was a. Uh, a legend or a myth or a dim memory of some ancient history has always troubled me. In sleep, I had the dreadful dream of the wave 
either coming out of the quiet sea or towering over the green islands. It still uh, appears occasionally, though I've now exercised it by writing about it. It always ends by surrender, and I wake grasping out of the deep water. And then he has this funny kind of uh, comment. I used to draw it or write bad poems about it. So this is definitely something that was a kind of a personal myth or the Atlantis myth was very much part of Tolkien's memory. He, he even mentions at one point that it might be some kind of ancestral memory that's kind of leaking through. And we've talked about some of that with uh, Dune and Benny Gesserit uh, podcasts. So, uh, you know, let's uh, take a look here. Let's start out with some really, I mean, you can't, this uh, cover, Ted Nasmith's amazing painting here. And this is the fall of Numenor. It's the ships. And, I mean, it's quite Atlantean, right? So so maybe we'll jump uh, back first to, um, we'll kind of get into the Tolkien history. Obviously, uh, as, uh, as people may know, uh, Tolkien had written uh, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. That takes place in the Third Age of Middle-earth. But he went back and he actually created kind of a, an origin story, like a backstory um, of the dawn. Actually, it's a world creation myth. It starts out with the creation of the world. And uh, from here, Tolkien uh, built up the mythology, not only of the creation of the, of the, of the universe, kind of. It's a, it's a creation myth. But then it's the birth of the creation of the, uh, the elves, uh, men, dwarves, uh, the history, the back history of all the elven kingdoms, and then this fascinating concept of um, uh, Numenor, which we'll, we'll kind of go into the island of Numenor, and also things like how the evil rose up. So there was successive uh, dark lords of these ages, and they kind of uh, had this Manichaean sort of balance between the light versus the dark and a lot of that will be interesting when we look at the um, emerald tablets because we see a lot of that atlantean talk in the emerald tablets from toth, toth the atlantean so maybe we'll start out first just to give us some grounding with plato and i just wanted to mention two quick topics here in plato because you know plato is where we get a real source of um atlantis uh, and, and in one of Plato's uh, dialogues, he talks about, before I begin my narrative, I must make a brief explanation here. Uh, about Solon had talked about this island, and this story has been kind of handed down. And he says, as we said before, when we were speaking of the lots, God divided the whole earth into lots, some larger and some smaller, and established their temples and sacrifices in them. Poseidon then, Thus receiving his lot, the Isle of Atlantis, settled his sons by a mortal woman in the district which now must be described. In the sea, the center of the island, there was a plain said to have been the most beauteous of all plains and very fertile. And he goes on to talk about the, the, the look of Atlantis. And then the whole island of Atlantis was split into ten parts. And he talks about the populations and how it was in the Atlantic and where it was, um, and it was named sort of after Atlas, and he goes into some talking about it. But this is the first sort of, and he kind of goes on and talks about the Acropolis of A A Atlantis. And then finally, the story ends without resolution. We've lost the end of this Plato dialogue, like it's not been preserved, but it says... Uh, and to see that they now began to seem foul, for they were losing the fairest bloom from their most precious treasure. But to such could not be seen the happy life, to appear at least fair and blessed. Indeed, now they were taken on the infection of wicked coveting and the pride of power. Zeus, the god of gods who governs his kingdom by law, having the eye by which such thing was seen, beheld their goodly house in the grievous plight and was minded to lay judgment on them that the discipline might bring them back in tune. So he gathered all the gods in the most honorable residence, even that which stands at the world's center and overlooks that he has part in becoming. And when he has gathered them there, he said, and that's it. We don't have, we've lost the end of this platonic dialogue. So all we know is there was an Atlantis and uh, 
they became wicked in some way, and then Zeus was going to try to correct their behavior, right? Now, so this is very interesting. Uh, we'll jump back to Pla Plato again, but I did want to talk about Thoth just for a minute. But here, he, in the Phaedrus, Plato also talks about um, the Egyptian god Thoth, who invents writing, okay? And he says, here, king, is a branch of learning. So it's Thoth speaking to the king. The people of e Egypt will be wiser and they'll have improved memories and they will have a recipe for wisdom and memory. So he's invented writing and he's presenting writing to the other gods. And then uh, the king answers, oh man, full of arts to one, it is given to create a thing of art. You have not, basically you have created forgetfulness because men will no longer keep the knowledge in their souls and they'll leave it in the books. Okay, so I just wanted to have this idea of forgetfulness um, with Thoth, the inventor of writing. Okay, so let's jump back into Tolkien. So Tolkien, uh, as we mentioned, has uh, his island of Numenor, and he also gives a description. So that as we have Plato's description of Numenor, we have um, Tolkien. So here's a map of uh, Numenor. Let's see here. And there's also a lovely painting of it here. But again, we have this kind of Atlantean view. The account of the island of Numenor that here follows is derived from descriptions of the simple maps that were preserved in the archives of the King of Gondor. And then you talk about Uh, such documents were preserved in Gondor, or Imladris, which were in the care of Elrond, were deposited with the surviving treasures in the, Norman, in the northern Numenorian kings, suffered from loss and destruction by neglect. So the records suffered from loss, forgetfulness. Uh, for the survivors of Middle-earth yearned, as they said, for the Akalabeth, the downfallen, which is the name of the story of fall of Numenor, the downfall, and even after long ages, ceased to regard themselves in the measure exiles, when it became clear that the land of gift was taken away and that Numenor had disappeared forever. All but a few regarded study of what was its history as vain, breeding, or useless regret. The story of Pharazon and his impious armada was all that remained generally known to the latter ages. So he said the land of Numenor was a five-pointed star. So you see here's Numenor in the different areas. It's a five-pointed star island. And um, it said, No building, no raised altar, not even a pike of undressed stone ever stood there, and no likeness in the temple did the Numenorians possess in all the days of their grace until the coming of Sauron, who is the, you know, the great evil one. And so, uh, yeah, so just, just a, a brief one. So here's, here's Tolkien at work placing... Um, uh, placing his version of an Atlantis back in the back history of his Lord of the Rings myth. And, um, you know, quickly jumping into other such placements, uh, just thinking of, you know, um, uh, Blavatsky here is talking about the uh, proliferation of ruins around the Atlantic here. And she's talking about uh, the perfect identity and rites and ceremonies, even the names of the deities among the Mexicans, the ancient Babylonians and the Egyptians are sufficient proof of South America peopled by a colony which mysterious found its way across the Atlantic. When? What period? History is silent on that point, forget it. But those who consider that there is no tradition sanctified by ages without a certain sediment of truth at the bottom of it believe in the Atlantis myth. There, scattered throughout the world, a handful of thoughtful and solitary students who pass their lives in obscurity far from the rumors of the world have studied the problems. And so basically she's just talking about um, the idea of there's these ruins around the ancient world, around the Atlantic, and how those ruins sort of tell of that kind of Atlantean diaspora, right? And even she mentions a bit of this Nagalism, you know, the Carlos Castaneda type Ar Ar Arjutas, Artufas, 
so the natives of the subterranean rooms with a single call. So here we just get a little bit of uh, context with Blavatsky, just talking about even in her time, they kind of were thinking like this Graham Hancock way of thinking that, hey, if there was really is an Atlantis, um, how does it fit with our history that we've handed down to it? We've forgotten history. And then there's this Atlantean history. And what Tolkien really set out in a lot of ways with his Silmarillion is, I, had, I remember he had mentioned that he was looking to make a mythology of England. Right, because so many of the traditions were lost, given all the different tribes and the renaming. And we talk about in the podcasts here uh, the confusion of names a lot, how there's lots of names. And, and I think that the names are an interesting place to start with, right? So, you know, we have Jupiter and Zeus, we have different god names, and yet the stories seem to coalesce back together. It comes out with our Lovecraft uh, podcast we did where uh, you have Nyarlathotep, right? Nyarlathotep, Lovecraft's Egyptian, but he's predating the Egyptians, right? He came out of Egypt and he's still alive. He's sort of like a Sauron or a Morgoth in, in the, in the, Sol in the Tolkien realm. Uh, so let's kind of go into that origin story a bit. So if we look at the beginning of the Silmarillion, and let's talk about the Silmarils as kind of the Atlantean technology, right? So first off, this is a fantastic painting. So in Tolkien's mythologies, um, there were uh, these, before the sun and the moon, there were these trees. One tree was like the golden tree, one was the silver tree, and that, and that became the sun and the moon. And then later, those lamps hung from trees and finally, the Silmarils were built even, even later. So the Silmarils are kind of tied to this technology of the light. And if we go all the way back to the beginning of Tolkien in the Silmarillion, we have this myth, mythology of the music of the spheres, sort of. So there's, there was Eru, the one, who in Arda is called Iluvatar. And he made the first Anur, the Holy Ones, who were the offspring of his thought. And they were with him before all, all else was made. And so it came to pass that Iluvatar called them all together. So, and they, to make harmony together in a great music. So in the, in the mythos of Tolkien's world, the God gathers his angels and they create music. And of course, there is one named Melkor who decides that he wants to take the music in a different direction. And Melkor is like a discord where um, the, the Ainur were creating the harmony. And the music rose and crashed and there was moments of great harmony and then moments of discord, like a great... Um, classical composition. And then um, Iluvatar basically told them to stop. And he made the music stop. And he said, like, kind of like, let there be light. And there they could see the world had been created. And sort of out of that music, and another beautiful painting, just a beautiful painting of the, you know, the island and the land. And so time goes on. And they created these trees. So it says, um, so again, this is before the sun and the moon, right? You had this, a light in the sky, a golden light. Um, and they said, in the time of the valor, they ordered the sea and the lands and the mountains. And since the fires are subdued or buried beneath the hill, the Varda filled the lamps. They had two mighty lamps for the lighting of Middle Earth which had been built amid the encircling sea. And then Varda filled the lamps and Manwe hollowed them and the Velar set them upon high pillars, more lofty far than any mountain of the latter days. One lamp was raised toward the north of Middle Earth and it was called Iluin. And the other was raised in the south and was named Ormal. And the light of the lamps of the Valar flowed out over the earth and they lit it as it was a changeless day. So in the beginning, 
there was just the light. So you've got the children of music, and now you have the children of light, so to speak, right? The trees and the light of the trees, okay? So maybe let's jump now to the emerald tablets, right? So in the emerald tablets, uh, you again, we go back to Thoth the Atlantean. He said, I, Thoth the Atlantean, keeper of the records, the mighty king magician living from generation to generation, about to pass into the halls of Amenti, down from the guidance of those who come after, the records of the mighty wisdom of great Atlantis. And he said, not as the little men of the present age did the mighty ones of Atlantis live and die, but rather from aeon to aeon, they renew their life in the halls of Amenti, where the river of life flows eternally onward. And they descended into darkness, into the light my strength and power renewed. For a time I descended, and the men of Chem, which is Egypt, shall know me no more, forgotten, right? In the time unborn I will rise again, and beware them, O men of Chem, you have falsely betrayed my teachings. Right. So they're talking about the children of light. So the wisdom of the children of light and the lords of life and the lords of death and the key of life. And this amazing time when um, the light was brought from the stars, basically, down to the earth. And they say that gradually from the kingdom of Atlantis passed waves of consciousness that began only with me, replaced by the spawn of a lower star. In obedience to the law, the word of the master grew into flower. Downward into darkness turned the thoughts of Atlanteans, until at last this wrath rose from the dweller, deep in the earth's heart. Right? The sons of Amenti heard, and hearing the direction of the changing flower of fire that burns eternally, shifting using the Logos until the great flower fire changes its direction. Over the world then broke the great waters, changing the earth balance until the temple of light was standing on the great mountain. So you can see there's something going on here. Suddenly over it rose the waters and vanished from earth until time appointed was the great temple. Fast we fled toward the sun of the morning until beneath us lay the land of the children of Chem. So they escaped to Egypt. Raging, they came with cudgels and spears, lifted in anger, seeking to slay and utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. Okay, so we get a bit of talk of the destruction of Atlantis and the halls of the life-giving light. Uh, we go back to the light. <coughs> uh, deep in the halls of life grew a flower, life-giving, light-giving, filled with power, all who came near it. Place they around it thrones, two, three, places for each of the children of light, place so that they were bathed in its radiance. So here we have again the teachings of the light. We have the Atlanteans with some kind of uh, light power. We've got the, um, the idea of the corrupt Atlantis, right? And um, in similarly in Tolkien, part of this battle or the destruction of Numenor comes with the rise of the dark influence from Sauron, right? So we have a note here, uh, and this painting is sort of that diaspora of uh, Atlantis, but we have a note a bit later that talks about the fall of, again, this great, great plate here. Elindil and his sons, after founded kingdoms in Middle Ages, in Middle Earth, and through their lore and craft was but an echo of that which had ere been Sauron came to Numenor. Yet very great it seemed to the wild men of the world, and Muncha said in other lore of the deeds of the heirs of Elendil, and the age that came after. So we're talking about the heirs of Elendil and the age of Sauron in the Third Age. So that's like the Lord of the Rings story. But before, we're, you were still in the uh, time before Numenor fell. Soren himself was filled with great fear and wrath of the Valar and the doom that Eru laid upon sea and land. And it was greater than aught he had looked for, hoping for the death of the Numenorans and the defeat of the proud king. And Soren, sitting back in the seat in the midst of the temple, had laughed when he heard the trumpets of Ar Farazan sounding for battle. And again when he laughed when he heard the thunder of the storm. And a third time even he laughed at his own thought, thinking that he would now, 
in the world, being rid of the Edain forever. He was taken in the midst of his mirth, and his seat in his temple fell into the abyss. But Sauron was not of mortal flesh, and though he was robbed now of that shape that he had wrought with great and evil, so he could never again appear, appear fair to the eyes of men. And he came back to Middle-earth and to Mordor, and that was his home. And he took up upon the great ring in Barad-dur, and dwelt there, dwelt in darkness and silence, until he wrought himself a new guise, a terrible image of malice and hatred made visible, the eye of Sauron the terrible. But these things could not come into the tale of the drowning of Numenor, for which they are now told. So we're now going to talk about the drowning of, of Numenor, and, and then Tolkien comes out and says... Uh, the exiles of the shores of the sea, they returned to the west at the desire of their hearts. They spoke of the Mar Nur Falmar that was whelmed in the waves, the Akalabeth, the downfallen, and the Atlante in the Eldarin tongue. So there's this word Atlante, like Atlantis. Among the exiles, many believe that the summit, the pillar of heaven, was not drowned forever. For it had been hallowed even in the days of Sauron. And there were some that said the seeds of the Elindil afterwards sought for it. Uh, and, and, and basically this word Atlante, if we take a look at it in the diction, in the glossary, the Atlante, I believe it's the, it's the fallen or the sunken, right? So it's sort of like you have this idea of the fall from grace, the descending, like it may mean. So uh, basically from there, the uh, ships leave. Uh, afterwards, because there was a lore master and far-sighted men, even the ruins at the heart of the Dunedain were still set westwards, and they knew indeed the world had changed. And they vanished from the earth, and the land of Amon had been taken away. Thus in those days, with the voyages of the ships, lore and starcraft, the kings of men knew that the world was indeed made round. So now this is weird. The earth used to be flat. Okay, so the earth was once flat, but then by the third age, the earth was made round. Right Now this is a fantastic thing because at the same time, um, with this war over the trees and the lamps, those are eventually destroyed. Right. So again, this kind of technology uh, that caused the Silmarils to be created. Right. So let's pause here for a moment and just go into some Steiner, because Steiner also talks about Atlantis and the the changing of the relation of planets to um, uh, Earth. So there's like a change of the planets, and he says here. Um, uh, so he's talking about the idea that in Atlantis before there was not a concept of duration. Right? So he says, old Saturn, there also emerges what we call time, the previous conditions. So again, Saturn is kind of the, the, the time force, the Saturn eating his children from the Greek myths. But he's got this kind of Sauron, this darkness. So like you can think of the timeless Eden and the time now being brought by, by Saturn. They belonged in a realm which spiritual science may be named duration. All that is said in this book of conditions of the realm of duration must be understood in that sense. It must be borne in the mind that any expression implying time relationship is used only for the sake of comparison and exposition. In human language, even those things which in a manner of speaking precede time can be characterized with words and the time concept is implicit. We must remember that the third and second Saturn states did not take place one after another in the present day sense of the word and cannot, after all, describe them in sequence. Now, this is interesting because Tolkien has, uh, Tolkien has the concept of the trees at first. I'm going to go back to that plate. The trees and the lamps where the light of the lamps of the Valar flowed over the earth so that all was lit as a changeless day. So at the beginning of days, there were no nights. There was just the days. And night came when the lamps were destroyed and the trees were destroyed. And that caused the need for the Silmarils to be made, right? In the time 
And in that time were made those things afterward, the most renowned of all the works of the elves. For Fianor, being come his full might, was filled with a new thought. And it might be some shadow of foreknowledge that came to him of the doom that drew near. And he pondered how the light of the trees, the glory of the blessed realm, might be preserved imperishable. Okay, technology. They lived in a paradise with the, the trees and the lights, the lamps. But Fianor the elf, he's, he's thinking ahead. He's like, what if something were to happen with the trees? Maybe we could make some kind of tech, right? How could it be, be preserved? And then he began a long and secret labor, and he summoned all his lore and his power and his subtle skill. And at the end of it all, he made the Silmarils as three great jewels they were in form. Not until the end, when Fionnur shall return, who perished ere the sun was made, sits upon the halls of awaiting and comes no more among his kin, not until the sun passes and the moon falls, shall it be known what substances they were made. Like the crystal of diamonds and appeared, and yet it was more strange than Adam more strong than adamant, and it had no violence that could mar it or break it within the kingdom of Arda, and yet that crystal was to the Simurils, but as is the body of the children of the Luvatar, the house of the inner flame, and within it, yet all the parts of it in life, and that inner fire of the Simurils, Fionor made the blended light of the trees of the Valinor. So he placed the light of the trees in the Silmarils. Right. So yeah, we'll, we'll, let's talk about that Silmaril and that light. So again, we're going back to the Emerald Tablets now. So Tolkien has Silmarils, and the Silmarils are the place where the light is held. Uh, and let's just talk about... the law and the light. So the children of the light and the kingdom of the light. So deep the mysteries of life I have traveled, seeking for what is hidden. So this is kind of like Fionnoy, seeking for this tech, right? Before the lords of Amenti hidden, I learned the wisdom unto men. Seven they are the lords of Amenti. Three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine are the titles of the masters of men. And from all came the Logos, instruments they had power over all. Sending forth the power shrouded in darkness. Light is his body. Flame is his countenance. Freer of the souls to the children of men. Five is the master, lord of magic. Six is the lord of light. Seven is he, the lord of vastness in the space. And the key to the of the times. Eight is he who orders the progress, weighs the balance in the journey of men. Nine is the father in his countenance, forming and changing out of, out of, out of forms of the formless. Turn thy thoughts upward to light into life. Find in the keys of the numbers I bring thee light on the pathway from life unto life. Seek ye with wisdom. Turn thoughts inward. Close not thy mind to the flower of light. Follow the path in the way I led, masters of light, the sun of the morning and the life of the children of men. So here it is, the light. The children of light and thoth. It says, ah. Uh, Freely I give to thee my wisdom, the mystery of the master of mysteries, the son of the morning, the living forever, the child of the light, shining with brightness, the star of the morning. Thoth, the teacher of men, is of all. Long time ago, in my childhood, lay neath the stars on long buried Atlantis, dreaming of mysteries far above men. So here we're talking about Atlantis and their knowledge of the light. And um, Tolkien really represents this, right? He's really, he's really pulled into this idea. And the other thing that's strange is that shift between the timeless world, right? Uh, and then the, so the Atlantean time is almost, there's no moon and sun as we know it today. It's not spheres circling. It's, they were trees and they were lamps and then they became these gems. And then the gems, the Silmarils themselves, um, would become the objects of the desires of uh, you know, the dark, dark lords. Right? If we uh, kind of go into this idea of the spheres a bit more, this time we're in uh, Steiner. 
It was during the evolution of the region of Atlantis that the actual separation of humanity into the men of Saturn, Sun, Jupiter, and Mars took place. Previously, no more than the initial tendencies in this direction had shown themselves. The division also into the waking and the sleeping state now entailed yet another important consequence, which came strongly into the evidence of the Atlantean humanity. During the night, so now we have the night, man's astral body and ego were in the realm of the beings above him, reaching as far as the spirits of personality. Through the portion of his life body that was not united with the physical, he could have perceptions of the sons of life, the angel and the fire spirits, the archangels, and during sleep with the portion of the life body. But the angels and the archangels, with the angels and the archangels, other beings became visible uh, directly due to the Luciferic influence. When these beings who had remained behind the sun or on the moon had not been able to enter the earth existence at all. And now there are individual beings of the Atlantean epic that were to a large extent enabled to avoid entanglements in the world of senses. And it goes on, goes on to the prophetic Christ revelation and how this is so there's sort of an Atlantean connection to, to, to Christ. Uh, but let's kind of go back though to Tolkien. So where, where, where have we gone so far? We've, we've seen Tolkien builds Numenor like an Atlantis myth, uh, like the myth of Atlantis. He has Atlantis related to the creation of um, the, uh, the sun and the moon, the trees, the light in his origin story, right? And now there's some tech, these stones, silmarils, these gems that contain the power of the light. We talked about there was no day before, right? And this sort of echoes the idea that Saturn brings duration, right? Saturn brings time. And then there's a bit of difference between the children of light and then the dark, right? And then there is this, we have that similar story with, um, with uh, the Silmarillion, with the fall of Numenor, in that there was a prideful attachment and Sauron sort of manipulating behind the scenes. So again, Sauron is sort of uh, time, satanic, all of these things. So let's talk about, we left Fëanor, he's found a way to capture the light of the sun and the moon in these gems. And all who dwelt in Arna were filled with wonder and delight at the work of Fëanor, and Varda hallowed the Silmarils, so that thereafter no mortal flesh, nor hands unclean, nor anything of evil, uh, will might touch them. And it scorched and withered, and Mandros foretold the fate of Arda, earth, sea, and the air locked within them. Thus, then, the heart of Fëanor was fast bound to these things that he himself had made. And then Melkor lusted for the Silmarils, and the very memory of their radiance was gnawing fire in his heart. From that time forth, inflamed by his desire, he sought ever more eagerly, how he should destroy Fëanor and end the friendship of the Valar and the Elves. But he dissembled his purpose with cunning, and, and nothing of his malice could yet be seen in the semblance that he wore. So he's plotting, he's plotting to take these Silmarils, right? So he sees their power, he's, he's lusting for that power of the light. And uh, again, we can talk about in the fall of Numenor, it's the story of the uh, uh, Arpharazon, right? So Arpharazon, if we take a, if we talk about Arpharazon, we definitely can see his temptation. You know, there was, so there was um, a ban on the, there was a ban on Numenor. Numenor could not travel. They didn't want the Numenorans traveling to, uh, you know, the Undying Lands. And Alpharazon uh, was a king of Numenor, and he was very, uh, he was very arrogant. He was very uh, proud, greedy. He wanted to rule the world, and he was under the influence of Sauron. So again, he's kind of the Atlantean king who uh, was in the Second Age, and he was the one who eventually 
they rose up um, worship of Morgoth again. And this is sort of part of how uh, Numenor ends up being, you know, the wrath of God, let's say, falls upon Numenor. Uh, let's jump into, uh, again, quickly, let's just talk about, you know, just as a quick uh, sea of names thing, Nyarlathotep, right? So you have Lovecraft having this similar instinct, right? So Lovecraft creates a god out of Egypt who is now in the modern day. So he lives to the next age, like Sauron, and then there's Morgoth and Melkor. Like, so Tolkien also has these dark lords of each age. And then Sauron sort of bridges the second age. So he was just a, he was like a blacksmith of Morgoth. And he fashioned his ring, and then that's what gave him the power into the Third Age, right? So it's sort of, he is, you know, kind of like a Sith Lord type of concept, you know, something where it's, there can be only one Dark Lord in each age. And, and I think Morgoth uh, eventually gets sent to, like, the, you know, the place out of time, some, some kind of... Uh, I'll leave a comment below, guys, if you know the name of it. But So, yeah, so this is very, very fascinating, the... Um, the, the subterranean kind of out of phase nature of, of how evil, you know, gets buried in the ocean. And, and we have this with Lovecraft's uh, Rilia yeah as well. So Rilia yeah kind of becomes the fearful version of Atlantis. So you kind of have two Atlantises, right? Uh, kind of a bit like the Luciferic and the Arimonic, right? You have the, the Luciferic is like a genius and, and illuminating. And then you have the Arimonic, which is sort of the demonic and the... And the uh, and uh, uh, enslaving, let's call it. It's like enslaving. So it's like the mindless and the genius are two different kinds of prides, right? And and that path between them, you sort of have the sunken Atlantis, which sinks because of pride. And then you have the sunken Rilia, yeah, which sinks kind of out of fear or some kind of dread, right? So there's genius and dread. In the, and, and then again, this is the moon and the sunlights too. You have to kind of, uh, see how those foil each other, right? So there's a sort of r relation across the two. So back to the, um, back to this space in the halls of Amenti. So deep in the earth's heart lay the halls of Amenti, far beneath the islands of sunken Atlantis, halls of the dead and halls of the limit, living, bathed in the fire of the infinite, all far in the past, lost in space, time the children of light looked down on the world seeing the children of men in their bondage bound to the force that came from beyond knew they that only by freedom from bondage could man rise from the earth to the sun the masters of everything said of their forming we are who formed from the space dust partaking of life and of the infinite all living in the world as children of men and there for the dwelling place far beneath the earth crust blasted great spaces by them with their power spaces apart from the children of men and there they shielded from the halls of the dead and they filled them with life and with light so you know this is maybe some dwarven type imagery some kind of interesting resonances here inside of the um emerald tablets so uh finally let's kind of jump back to steiner again and he talks about in his man in the evolution of the world, right? So here we have the concept of evolution of the world. It says, um, no, not all the parts of the earth are used up in the construction of humans. We must not imagine that earth in its nocturnal time consists entirely of the disintegrating corpses and seed that awaits to reawakening. reawakening. They are embedded in other forms fashioned out of other substance of earth. The nature of this will be revealed later. So the condensation process still goes further. To the watery element is added the solids. So we talk about the descending of, 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 of the light down into the matter. And, um, and this goes back to his idea of there's moon energy and there's sun energy. And then each of the planets have a, a, a kind of role in the, not only the light body, but in the physical body. So I think maybe that's a good place to, to leave things off in the, in the light body. So the idea here is, Tolkien, um, maybe the final thoughts on this, uh, again, what's very interesting to me is in his dreaming of the Atlantis myth and recasting of the Atlantis myth, 
it seems that I don't believe Tolkien was a reader of the Emerald Tablets. He may have been. I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows of any talking of this. But it seemed that his inspiration came mostly from his knowledge at that time of Atlantis and his, his dreams and inspiration of Atlantis. And I think what's very fascinating is how a lot of these Atlantean concepts that come to us from Blavatsky, they come to us from Steiner, they come to us from the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, uh, Hermes Trimagestus, they seem to emerge with, the, with a lot of these Manichaean uh, conflicts, right? The Children of the Light, uh, the Trees of Light, the lamps that light the world in an eternal day, an Eden, the darkening of, of the world. There's a darkening of the world in one of the early battles of the first Dark Lord. And this is where that necessity came to have the Silmarils. Let's capture these lights. And then eventually the earth is made into a sphere and the sun and the moon are cast into the heavens. In that third age, we're, we're kind of like in the fourth age, I guess in Tolkien's time or some fifth age, who knows, but... These kind of relate to Blavatsky's ages, right? Or the, um, you know, the current period, the Atlantean period, the Lemurian period, these sort of ages of time. So uh, fascinating stuff. Can do lots more of podcasts on this. We could dig deep on the Silmarillion, uh, Numenor. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you are interested in some more Tolkien-based uh, podcasts. Uh, I just wanted to scratch the surface today on Silmarillion and Atlantis and bring up a couple of research points that I found interesting. Hopefully you guys found this interesting. Uh, appreciate your comments below. Looking forward to next podcast. We're going to be talking about, uh, we've got an interesting one talking about Giordano Bruno and looking at, of all things, the E8 supersymmetry it's like an eighth dimensional higher order math and Giordano Bruno's Bruno's uh the shadow of ideas so uh looking forward to that one that one will definitely be sort of Neoplato Neoplatonism meets higher order math in the future of physics so looking forward to doing that one next I've uh, been doing some good research on that Hopefully this has been um, interesting for everyone. Goal here too is when I get to a thousand uh, subscribers, I would like to start doing this um, as a live podcast. So uh, hopefully 2022 we can get us there. So please uh, helps a lot if you can subscribe. And looking forward to your comments below and to seeing you uh, next week. Check out our other book reviews. Again, check out for your... Lovecraftian holiday gift giving. Check out our links below in the bookstore. And thank you very much for your time. Take care. Bye-bye.